Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. And today I'm very happy that I'm uh, presenting one of the important uh, orthopedic uh, topic before you. And in fact, it concerns uh, you also. Uh, that is uh, the open fracture or what was earlier known as compound fractures. Uh, there are few emergencies in orthopedics. The open fracture is one of that. Other emergencies are uh, the vascular injury associated with fractures like supracondylar brachial artery injury, supracondylar fracture femur with popliteal artery, etc. So they take the priority one and then there are compartment syndromes, then there are dislocations, the open fractures, the cauda equina syndrome, etc. There are some of them and uh, today I will be sharing uh, information on the open fracture. Earlier this is known as compound fracture. Compound fracture was a, a kind of a misnomer and uh, it was not uh, in fact giving the right information about uh, the fracture uh, etc. So they thought to choose it to label as open fractures. Open fracture is self-explanatory since people have been uh, well versed with compound fracture since very long the practice still continues. So in spite of that uh, we will uh, go ahead with the no. coming to the uh, definition of open fracture what is open fracture open fracture is one where there is breach in the soft tissue envelope of an extremity wherein the fracture directly or fracture hematoma is communicating with external environment Directly the fracture ends may be exposed or there is no fracture visible but there is a wound through which the blood is oozing out. So that is also equally known as the compound fracture. There is something called a technically compound fracture. What happens is a patient comes to you with a history of injury and there is a obvious fracture and you can make out from the deformity. And uh, on the whole limb there is an wound. Looking at it you do not know whether it is communicating with the fracture or not and uh, you will only know when you explore the wound and find out. For, for practical purpose all such wounds are considered as open fractures and treated accordingly. One that is frankly communicating is open fracture, one that is doubtful not possible to predict what it is. Those are labeled as technically compound fracture. I already told you that this is an emergency, it should be treated immediately and uh, it has been seen that those fracture that treated early, they have got a long impact on the outcome result. Say for example, here we have given the example of uh, a fracture that is treated early within 6 hours and after 6 hours. Obviously, the outcome is bad in those cases where there is uh, late treatment. It is often I must uh, bring to your attention that uh, it is said that uh, in all open fractures, the outcome is decided by the medical officers who see them first. Whether it is delayed, whether appropriate uh, debridement done or a mobilization done, antibiotic given that is the one that makes the difference. Subsequent orthopedic surgeon, however expert he may be, plastic surgeon, however uh, excellent he may be, the residual problem is going to be there because it was not treated in the first place correctly. So it makes a big impact if you initiate the treatment early and rightly. Just while going through the uh, treatment, management of uh, open fracture, one needs to understand these four eras and uh, it is interesting how the management has evolved over a period of time. Now coming to the era of life preservation, in those days I must give the example of Prussian war, Crimean war, etc. During those time nothing was there and whenever there was a compound injury of femur tibia, most of the patients used to die. I must tell you that uh, mortality of compound fracture in femur used to be 80 percent. 
60 percent like in a forearm fracture, tibial fracture 36 percent. So, those days they used to treat the compound fracture to save the life and then came the era of limb preservation. Now, there were some techniques that came into existence that made the difference on the management. One was the debridement. Debridement was somewhere a Napoleon army surgeon. He uh, introduced the concept of uh, the debridement. Thereafter, sometime in uh, 1700, uh, late 1700, the Lister introduced the concept of aseptic surgery. So, they made a big difference and thereafter rate of infection dropped. The treatment those days, particularly in World War and 1 and 2, they were done basically to preserve the limb, fine. Then comes the era, one by one, 1931. Alexander Fleming introduced the penicillin, the first antibiotic and subsequently in 40s and 50s many other antibiotics came and they made a big impact on the outcome of again the compound fracture. Here the life was in any case would have been saved, limb would have saved what they were trying hard to control the infection. So, then the comes the present era in which we are living, we are trying to achieve a result in all the compound fractures to the pre-injury level, fine. Life, limb, we take for granted that it is going to be saved, infection will be controlled. What we are going to do is to restore the individual to his pre-injury level with all these uh, very skilled techniques that have come in. Of course, the antibiotic, very powerful and wide spectrum antibiotics are available, blood transfusion techniques are available, vascular reconstructions are available, minimally invasive external fixation is available and the chain of evacuation of patient from initial uh, time, site of injury to the tertiary care hospital has improved. As a result, it has made a big difference. Yeah, I have mentioned that the, uh, just alone the debridement and the hand washing made the big uh, difference of drop from 60 percent to 25 percent and of course, all these various techniques that came subsequently uh, made a bigger impact. Now, the etiology, in our scenario, the almost 65 to 70 percent of the compound fractures are because of road traffic accident. Over the period of time, Roads have been congested, there is no following of the rules, traffic rules and drinking and driving, these are getting messed up. As a result, we are getting at least in India a high rate of road traffic accident. Speed of vehicle has improved and uh, that has also greatly contributed to the severe high velocity energies. Similarly, penetrating injuries with any sharp instrument, uh, gunshot, missile injuries, blast injuries, of course, industrial and earthquakes, they contribute relatively little to the or main load of open fracture. Now, coming to the classification of open fractures. Now, the classification is basically required to group all similar injuries in one place and that should guide us for the treatment and that should also help us in evaluating the outcome. So, that is how this Gustillo Anderson classification was developed in 1984 and uh, based on, I, I must tell you that the basis of classification of this open fracture is uh, two things. One is the size of the wound. It is very minor, but uh, they have given weightage to the size of the wound. Number two, the soft tissue injury, size of the wound and soft tissue injury. Second is quantum of contamination, quantum of contamination a wound which is sustained in a farm gland or with a fecal contamination becomes straight away type 3 injury even in spite of the wound being small one because the chances of developing complication are more in that case, fine. And the third is the type of bony injury. These are the basis on which these are classified. Type 1 where it is basically a minor injury. 
individual falls a sharp fragment of the bone pierces the skin and again it goes back wound seals these are relatively clean injuries with little contamination so they are classified as type 1 here the damage to these soft tissues is little and most of the times the fracture is transverse or oblique so this is type 1 injury fine coming to the type 1 injury where the injury is more than 1 cm and there is some amount of soft tissue injury again injury to the bone is either oblique or transverse the comminution shows it is a very high velocity injury here in all these type 1 and type 2 it is a low velocity injury low velocity injury high why it makes the difference is the velocity gets transferred to the tissues and there is where a disruption of tissue takes place and avulsion resulting in poor vascularity now coming to the type 3 a open type 3 fractures earlier it was only one group and now they have sub classified into the uh, 3 a b c based on the severity of the soft tissue injury and bony injury now here it is a obviously a high velo uh, high velocity injury there is lot of stripping of the soft periosteum and crushing of the muscle and subcutaneous tissue fine however in spite of all this the bone can be covered with muscle or the subcutaneous tissue okay so this is type 3 one thing and type of bony injury may be comminuted one fine so here there is a lot of crushing is there stripping of the bone is there vascularity is deprived but still bone can be covered with the muscle or some soft tissue coming to the b here again the high velocity injury comminuted fracture extensive stripping of muscle periosteum and uh, one thing here is that the skin or muscle is so much damaged you cannot cover the exposed bone type 3 b the bone remains exposed you can't cover some plastic surgery or some flap cover is required to cover it now coming to the last part of uh, the compound uh, fracture that or open fracture is the type 3 c open again high velocity injury here the problem is the wound may be small the injury to the muscle may be relatively less compared to the 3 a and b but what is damaging here is the vascularity there is a vascular damage requiring surgical repair this surge this vascular damage what it will do is it will deprive the uh, this uh, muscle and the skin of the vascularity and it results in necrosis death and gangrene so that's why even in spite of less tissue damage it is been given a higher weightage fine this are the broad classification of the open fractures in type 1 type 2 and type 3 so as the grade increases severity increases complications incur, increase and the difficulty in management similarly outcome is also bad in all these cases i'll come to that in the last slide now coming to the principle of uh, management i told you all these are uh, emergency uh, uh, injuries and when they come to the hospital so essentially one need to take the history where this injury was sustained i told you the sustaining injury in a very clean atmosphere and in a farmland in a dirty area it makes a big difference the site of injury and what is the mechanism of injury how it is sustained in addition to this one need to take the details about the morbidity of the patient a patient who is having who is a smoker alcoholic diabetic all these associated comorbidities do influence the outcome fine so that is it now coming to the physical examination compound injuries whether it is a type 1 or type 3 we consider it, uh, it as a high velocity injury whenever there is a high velocity injury in addition to the compound fracture there are likely to be other injuries 
it may be head injury it may be chest abdomen pelvis spine so one need to give attention to that first otherwise life is at risk fine rather than giving attention to the open injury open uh, fracture one need to rule out this has he got any head injury has he got any hemodynamic instability rule out those once that is confirmed then we come to the local part fine so similarly one need to see the neurovascular is there any associated emergencies also neurovascular injuries dislocations etc compartment syndrome and all fine then when you come to the local examination the priority of open is last after you have ruled out any life threatening injury a b c d f the trauma then you come to the local examination where the wound is located what is the extent of the injury and uh, how much neurovascular damage is there i must tell you one thing that whenever do you do the local examination it is always incomplete you cannot see the wound incomplete whatever visible you see you don't explore it real extent of injury is gauged at the time of surgery fine so that is remember you may assess it as a type 3a but it turns out to be a something else on the table so that is one should uh, be aware about that Uh, do rule out the presence of gas in the tissues because most often many of the patient after the injury do not come to hospital early they spend a lot of time because these are all contaminated by clostridial organism the chances of developing this infection is very high and uh, these are very fatal infections so ne one need to feel for the crepitus the toxemia the dusky color bad fall smell what they call is uh, 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 fishy smell there is a peculiar smell that has got this guy is getting one so coming to the radiological examination in open fracture there is hardly any radiological examination we stick to the basic take the local x ray ap and the lateral view when the patient has associated injuries we need other investigations ultrasound abdominal ct mri etc but uh, it is always when it comes to the open fracture it is the local uh, x rays that is what it is all required now coming to the atypical level i told you the person who sees them the first decides the outcome of open fracture when he comes to you yes uh, many uh, heroic things need not be done because at is at your establishment many things may not be available at your disposal what you can do best and uh, that is rather far more important than what surgeon does in a bigger hospital is the open injury should be without manipulating or anything covered with clean wet dressing there should be a fair amount of pressure some amount of pressure so that further bleeding is prevented we had the habit of uh, putting povidone iodine antibiotic soaked dressing but that is not required povidone iodine what it does is the it stains the tissue and as a result what when you are actually doing the debridement and all the color of the muscle becomes different and moreover it is said that adding antibiotic into the initial dressing or subsequent dressing does not improve the outcome and uh, this is what one should uh, don't use any antibiotic saline just saline 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 that's it you can measure clean it whatever is gross contamination is there and thereafter splint this there may be thoma splint or there may be a kramer wire splint any of the splint you have just this is the biggest thing you can do at your setup reason is by splinting you are reducing the pain you are reducing the further damage to the soft tissue and the vessel i think i give more weightage a treatment at the periphery than at the center in a bigger hospital because this makes a big difference on the patient so this one should do without avoiding it splinting even if you are sending him to the x ray or anything do apply splint send him yes at your level you can do is the injection tetanus toxide and starting antibiotic at your level because you are the first person that he comes to you 
and you have the lead time in covering with antibiotics. Fine. And uh, because from your place, the subsequent hospital may be far off. He may not get the easy way of transport. The time may get delayed. So are the antibiotics. Most of the times, the antibiotic and orthopedics are very simple and straightforward. The first generation. We are more worried about few things. One is Streptococcus, Staphylococcus and the Clostridia. All these organisms are quite uh, sensitive to the first generation of cephalosporins. You may use either cefazolin or you can use cefuraxime, whatever is available. And uh, then comes, I have given the detailed antibiotic chart subsequently, then you can transfer the patient to the next available hospital. Fine. Yes, this is the message I wanted to convey that earlier you treat, start the antibiotics, the rate of infection, the rate of complication is very less in the management because from you the patient may reach the hospital after 6 hours later, 10 hours later based on the availability of the transport. So you are going to make a big difference to these patients that is what I want to emphasize. But now when it comes to the tertiary care or orthopedic center, fine. They have the establishment to manage these uh, uh, compound fracture and uh, that is not great that we will be doing here, fine. So here I always tell you that after you have seen at your level the associated injuries and you have ruled out those, we at our level again start the same thing. What is known as triage, we see what are the life threatening injuries he has got and rule out that first, then come to the subsequent management of the injuries. Whatever you have started the antibiotics, we will continue the same one. Most of the times in these cases type 1, the antibiotic regime is only 24 hours because they are relatively, I will come in greater detail with that, yes. Now this antibiotics uh, in type 1, I said cefazolin is given 2 grams, 8th hourly. 24 hours. If you do not have cefuraxime, 1.5 grams and again thrice 24 hours. Many a times they are, uh, if uh, there is a contamination with uh, form, fecal matter, something like that in a bad uh, external condition, add penicillin. That I will give you the details of the charge there now. Here next comes the important thing. One thing I must tell you also, antibiotic is no replacement for proper deployment. It has to be done early and thoroughly. That is it. And uh, yes, when he comes here, we do the deployment. Fine. And uh, do I am giving you the, these just steps and I will uh, elaborate them in greater detail. Then comes to the repeat deployment. Many a times what happens? The crushing is so much, the damage is so much, in one go we are not able to completely deprive the wound. Wait for two to three days again there is a necrosis, slough that is there, we repeat the debridement, fine. We will keep repeating the debridement till healthy tissue is there, fine. Unless you cleared the healthy tissue, it is not going to be all right, fine. Then comes the, once we have done the debridement job completely, the fracture needs to be stabilized, that is the next step. Whether you do with external fixation, internal fixation, let us study how we do it. Now, Many a times, in all type 3 fractures, there may be difficulty in covering the wound. 1 and 2, yes, you can cover it after debridement. In type 3, there may be a problem. In those cases, we do not try to close the wound, leave it as it is and try to cover it after about between 3 to 5 days, either with the skin graft or with some kind of a flap. Okay. Now, then there is a bone loss is there. A segment of bone may have been gone out of the body and fallen on the road. There is a big gap there. So that needs to be covered. That will be covered in the subsequent reconstructive management. Then comes lastly the re rehabilitation. Once you have achieved the skin closure, the length gain, then comes the rehab. It is going on, ongoing process and patient should achieve the function after his injuries treated. Let us go one by one about uh, these things. Huh. This is what I just told you that use early antibiotics, 
started it is your level only in your own clinic you can start without fail only uh, first generation cephalosporins whatever is that because they are the one very sensitive to the streptoencephalococcus yes you can straight away start it iv antibiotic early antibiotic duration i told you 24 hours in type 1 and type 2 in case of type 3 we need to continue for 72 hours whenever we do the debridement continue the antibiotic so this goes on so there is a prolonged uh, antibiotic coverage for the uh, type 3 but type 1 and type 2 more or less it is 24 hours but definitely one can make an individual uh, choice in continuing the antibiotics yeah should we take the wound culture in these situations patient comes with an extensive wound what should we do uh, it has been seen that taking a culture from the open fracture does not really help because one that you take and the one the infection that happens subsequently there is a no match so they don't recommend taking any culture but do take out take a biopsy to rule out the clostridial infection so that is it for a routine bacterial culture and growth and all we don't take it so that is about the culture this is the antibiotic uh, protocol type 1 and uh, just uh, cephalosporins or cephazolin and type 2 again the treatment is same yes in case of 3 there is a difference even in type 1 and 2 if there is in bad contamination you can give the penicillin there also if you feel that there is a possibility of contamination with uh, clostridia right so in case of uh, type 3 injuries in addition to cephalosporin first generation we add gentamicin or vancomycin based on the availability now coming to the operative definitive management of a compound fracture in a hospital in our situation now patient you have ruled out all uh, emergency or uh, life threatening injuries take him to the ot now once he is on the ot table what should we do should we use tunique or not to use the tunique by and large we should avoid using the tunique because the skin is already uh, uh, soft tissues are already crushed dead and uh, to know the viability if you tie the tunique you will not be able to know the bleeding so why should we keep in c2 yes many times while you are cleaning the wound some clot may dislodge and it may start bleeding just to prevent that we keep the tunique in c2 but may not use it fine it is already a bad wound ischemic wound should not use. okay now this will uh, interfere with the identification of viable tissue i'll come to that how the viable tissues are uh, okay prepare the skin with one of the routine anti uh, antiseptic it may be povidone iodine it may be the savlon it may be chlorhexidine whatever in your practice we are doing it we can use it only skin is prepared when it comes to preparing the wound don't use any antiseptic on the wound because everything is harmful chemicals are harmful to the tissue all these tissues are bathed in saline saline is the best treatment for the or best antibiotic for the soft tissues so just irrigate with saline whatever dirt is there just clear it off and uh, only that should be saline should be used once you have cleaned it drape it and now start the debridement now coming to what is the debridement it is a french napoleon surgeon uh, the dassault in 1839 he coined this term and uh, jean lapierre also used this uh, uh, term the debridement debridement is excision is a wound excision all the dead necrotic tissues are removed so that is what is known as debridement i told you the debridement is so important this alone made the difference from the mortality of 60 percent to 25 percent so this is the effect you may not give antibiotic but debridement is very essential so this is the importance of uh, debridement in debridement what you what we do is all the dead necrotic tissue that is there is excised all the foreign 
body that is there. Many a times there may be a leaf, stick, uh, all kind of local uh, roadside items, foreign bodies will be there. All the sand, dirt, mu uh, uh, this mud may be there. All wash it out, wash it out thoroughly. All loose hanging subcutaneous tissue, fat that comes, take it off, fine. And uh, clot that is there, remove it. Many a times, you may require to explore the wound. To look at it is a small one and when you, if you explore it, there the damage is extensive. In all compound fractures, you need to evaluate the underlying tissues. If required, explore the wound, extend the incision, do the thorough debridement. Fine. So, that is it. And uh, dead muscle looks purplish, dusky color and it does not contract when you cut and does not bleed. So, you should excise all this ruthlessly till four C's are there in muscle. What are those four C's? C is color. Healthy muscle looks pink. Color, consistency, firm consistency. If the muscle is soft, it is a dead muscle. Consistency and contractility. If you cut, if you hold with the forces, the muscle contracts. That shows it is alive. And last one is capacity to bleed. Fine, if you cut, it bleeds, it is a viable muscle. That is how we make it out and that you do. And there should not be any conservation while doing the deprivement because muscle forms the best culture material for the bacteria, particularly the Clostridia. And if you leave any dead muscle, that is a nutrition for them and their infection flourishes. So, that is how you should be a bit harsh, thorough in the deprivement. Fine. Again, subcutaneous tissue. Subcutaneous tissue, loose fat that is there, hanging fat, long fascia, which is totally uh, lying loose in the wound, all should be taken out. And uh, again, many a times we used pulse lavage. Pulse lavage is a kind of an uh, uh, pulse trial irrigation system that takes out all the foreign material, dead material and all. Many a times we tend to use forceful irrigation that is not required should not be doing it, but whatever the dead and dirty thing is there, it will go into the muscles in the tissue. No forceful irrigation, it is just a pulse lavage is quite fine. Many times we do irrigation, I think uh, I'll, uh, there is a statement here that comes subsequently that I will be telling you. Yes, now coming to the subcutaneous tissue uh, that I told you then again, coming to the management of the bone. See, this is a so much of bone are comminuted, they are all cortical bones. If you leave it loose in the wound, they are not going to revascularize. It will act as a foreign body. It becomes a site for the growth of the organism. Take out all of them. Subsequently, you can manage the gap. Fine. So, this is it. But however, whenever there is an articular fragment which has uh, which has got some attachment to the soft tissues, keep it. Subsequently, it will get vascularized and that is how you see these are the, these are the articular component that have been reconstructed here and it is healed well. So, that is the message. Small fragment which are totally free from the attachment, take them off. Any large fragment that has got the attachment, keep it in the bone, keep it in the wound. Subsequently, it will get incorporated, fine. So, that is the whole thing. Now, coming to the wound irrigation I was telling you, there is a saying, the solution to the pollution is dilution, fine. So, the best antibiotic for the tissues is the saline. More and more you wash all the bacteria get washed out, all the clot, fat, everything. You have done the debridement, what is the loose tissue is there, it is washed out. And you should use, they say that in a case of type 1 and type 2, you may use about 3 liters of saline. In a type 3, it may go to 9 to 12 liters. So, that is the quantum of irrigation you do, fine. So, this is after you do the initial debridement, fine, okay, that is it. Now, coming to the nerve and tendon, what should we do? 
by and large we don't do anything to the nerve and uh, tendons because it is already infected anything you do it will get spoiled so mark them leave them alone when everything heals up we can do the reconstruction now wound closure yes in type n 1 and 2 where the wound is less than 1 centimeter more than 1 centimeter clean cut less contamination let contusion of the margin yes you can close primarily because since he is going to be under your observation you can manage to close see that there is no tension fine and you can just loosely close if you are in doubt there is a saying that if you are in a doubt whether to close or not to close don't close fine you can always achieve the closure once there is no sepsis fine so that is it the problem basically comes in the type 3 wounds where the damage is extensive in those cases i think you should avoid closing it and opt for delayed closure or split thickness skin graft or a flap so that is usually in all these cases like in this case they have stabilized the wound and soft tissue coverage is given after some time fine so they say that earlier you cover the wound lesser the chance of infection that's why most of these compound fractures should be closed within three to five days more you leave the bone and muscle open higher the chances of necrosis and residual infection osteomyelitis that is going to come fine so usually what we do in our setup is whenever we are doing this type three type of wound management call the plastic surgeon also along with us so that he is also involved in the management in the day on the day one so that is the whole aim okay now comes to the stabilization after you have dealt with uh, debridement and now come to the stabilization of the fracture you cannot leave the open fracture just like that it has to be stabilized whether it is a pop whether it is internal fixation external fixation the stabilization helps in healing of the soft tissues they are put in alignment and you facilitate healing by stabilization bone will heal soft tissues will heal if there is any vascular injury that will also facilitate healing so in type 1 and 2 where the contamination is little internal fixation can be done it is said that in case of tibia and the femur type 1 2 3 a can be fixed with intramedullary nailing fine subsequently wound can be managed with graft flap etc fine when it comes to type 3 b what does it type 3b mean type 3b is the wound damage is so extensive that you cannot cover the bone bone remains open these are the ones where you should treat with external fixators external fixator will take hold only on the bone with a very small pin and it doesn't uh, facilitate infection at all without facilitating infection it will keep the bone stabilized yes once you are given the flap everything you can take off the fixator either treat it in pop or internal fixation with nailing fine so either way based on the in case of type 3 where there is a vascular injury these are the cases where limb is at risk one should act directly do the angiography doppler know the level of the vascular damage and accordingly plan the intervention with the help of vascular surgeon now you have done everything there is a gap large piece of bone is missing from the tb or the femur now there are ways to manage this if the gap is small then you can take the iliac crest bone graft put it and bone will heal once it heals you can give the limb brace if it is a one centimeter or so if there is a extensive damage like this wherein what is known as elizero bone transport can be done where gap up to five or ten centimeters can be covered can be generated this is how it is managed or one can use the 
micro surgery and do vascular fibular graft fine in the presence of compound injury we should not be doing dead bone graft it should be vascular so that it can resist the infection fine so this is about it uh, a bone graft coming to the outcome of open fracture just uh, look at it the they have analyzed the 1500 compound fractures of various grades and just found what is it like of course type 1 2 3 a the rate of infection is minimal fine and in case of 3b the infection is quite high because the bone was lying exposed bone was lying exposed for some time where the infection takes the root the rate of infection type 3b 47 rate of amputation 16 percent and in type 3c the rate of amputation is 42 because there was a vascular damage fine so this is many a times patient do not come early by the time they come here warm ischemic time has already passed as a result most of them they go in for amputation fine so this is about the compound fractures thank you for your kind attention and uh, I will be pleased to answer your queries.